Okay, so we might get started. Welcome to all our viewers and thanks for tuning in today. I'm Janelle and I work on the Sustainable Agriculture Program here at Geocatch. Geocatch is a catchment management group working in partnership with our community, industry and agencies to care for the geographic catchment. If this is your first webinar experience, don't worry, no one can see you or hear you. So if you need to ask a question or if you have a comment, please look down to the bottom of your screen now. You'll see a chat button. I have already typed in a couple of questions or comments. Um, so just ensure that you have selected the chat button and you have selected to all panelists and attendees. I hope that you can see my two comments there. I have sent one where I've said, welcome everyone. And the next one I've written, um, will be starting at 12 noon sharp. So if you've got any questions throughout our presentations today, please type them in there and we will address them throughout the webinar if we have time or we can follow up with you afterwards if we run out of time. When the webinar closes today, there'll be a quick two minute um, survey that will pop up. So we'd really appreciate your feedback if you can please complete that. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country that we are meeting on today and honour the elders past, present and emerging. Thank you to our funding partners, the Dung Beetle Ecosystem Engineers and Revitalising Geograph Waterways Projects. Dung beetles was raised as a topic of interest at one of our uh, farmer group meetings. So hence we have organised today and we are very lucky to have two guest speakers to speak with us about dung beetles today. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Cathy Dawson from the Southern Forest Community Landcare and Southwest Coordinator of the Dung Beetle Ecosystem Engineers Project. Welcome to Cathy. There we are. Hi, uh, thanks Janelle. Uh, thanks very much um, to GeoCatch for inviting us to participate in this particular um, webinar today. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to Janelle and Sarah for their involvement in organising this webinar where we're all sort of fumbling a little bit, learning as we go. This national program, actually it's really international because there are multiple partners here um, throughout Southern Australia and also New Zealand and also we've got collaborators in Morocco and France where beetles that are being accessed through this project are, are being sourced. So the funding is from the Australian Government's um, Rural R&D for Profit program and the MLA's donor company are leading this application or this particular project. The Catchments Council is very interested in being an active partner uh, and assisted significantly in the development of the application and the planning process because our previous experience made us very aware of significant gaps. There are gaps in beetle activity seasonally and geographically. There are gaps in our knowledge, our farmers' knowledge and farm advisors' knowledge of dung beetles and how to manage them with livestock. Uh, there are gaps in national database of records of where beetles have been released and, and follow-up surveys of uh, seeing whether they've been established. Very significantly, there's a gap in any structured succession planning of dung beetle expertise. Many of our experts were involved when the project started in the 60s and as you can appreciate are now elderly. So we definitely were a willing partner in this particular project. Our role, a Warren Catchments Council's role, um, is to monitor sites um, as you can see here, the, the number of activities that we were uh, charged to do. The area though that we're coordinating is in the southwest from say roughly Mandurah to Esperance. And our budget 
was really stretched very thin to do justice to this particular set of functions that we needed to do. So what have we done so far? In the um, monitoring program, the, the reason why we're particularly interested in monitoring is because our earlier experience indicated that there were gaps and we needed to have a really good idea of where those gaps were, which particular soil types or climatic areas um, or different livestock production, cattle, sheep, etc. So we're, we've set up, um, the, the program has set up uh, a monitoring protocol, which is being replicated throughout Southern Australia. Um, and we are monitoring more than our allocated up to 10 sites because that doesn't give us a really good idea of, um, of the populations. Um, but we're assisted by farmers who are volunteering to do on their property and I'll talk about that a little bit later. In their breeding program, John Allen at Kudanup College, agricultural teacher there, has been involved in a dung beetle program since um, in the 80s when he was working in the Department of Agriculture on the CSIRO uh, breeding and release program. John's maintained an active interest in, in uh, dung beetles and actually he's a WA supplier. People are interested in sourcing dung beetles. John, um, John is the man to go to in WA. Nurseries have been set up on farm and um, Harvey Agricultural College is also rearing beetles. We've actively distributed beetles that have already become established in Australia on the Fagus Gazella on two sites, um, an artist Pecuarius and Copris Hispanus. Um, they're already existing, Pecuarius in the Eastern States, Hispanus here in the Williams area. And we're attempting in this project to increase their range. And we've also um, conducted some extension activities across the Southwest. So the monitoring program that I spoke about is really, uh, it, it's um, a protocol we're all following and it's feeding into a national database to build our understanding of species presence um, in particular, not necessarily absence, but presence throughout the Southern Australia. And, and we're following a common protocol. The platform we're using is one that the Department of Agriculture or DPER developed, the My Pest Guide. It's a, an additional um, add-on to that project on the dung beetle survey. So you can use either the My Pest Guide or download the My Dung Beetle Reporter from your regular app stores. Um, and when we go to a site, there are four traps per site. They're set up 24 hours later, then returned and uh, all the samples are collected. They're distributed to um, UWA, where they're, they're uh, being analysed, identified, species are being identified and quantified, and that data is feeding into a national database. It's possible for producers themselves to use this app and take photographs of beetles that they find. Uh, most importantly is to put on, make sure that your location is live so that when you report this particular beetle, we can identify where it's being, um, where, where you're finding it. Now, dung beetles tend to be, pre be pretty mobile um, and don't like to sit still for a photograph. So they can be cooled down. So dunk them in some chilled water and that will give you a, a few moments before they warm up um, to get some good quality um, macro photos. Take different profiles. Um, and put a coin beside it or a ruler so uh, that will assist in the identification of this particular species when we can see how big it is. Alster University is responsible for developing a website for the project and you see down the bottom there the web address is dungbeetles.com.au 
This particular page on the website is a representation of historical information about beetle presence. The map has been divided into the 56 national res uh, management regions uh, throughout Australia. One of the issues on this, I'm focusing here on the Southwest region, our Southwest Catchments Council's region, is that it extends from the coast to significant um, distance inland. And of these species that are listed, that pop up when you click on a particular region, not all those species are in any one place. For example, Intermedius is a species that's in the, uh, in the wheat belt area, in drier areas. The monitoring program is developing an additional layer, and that's also accessible on this website, which will show where uh, the data that we've collected through our monitoring, um, where the species are being, um, it gives you more fine grained detail. And, and we're working on that, that's a work in progress. Check the website. Now, as I mentioned, that we were contracted to monitor up to 10 sites. Now, we know that 10 sites is inadequate to give Southwest coverage. So, we're assisted by farmers in Harvey, Donnybrook, Cogenup, uh, Mount Barker, Redmond, and even over in Esperance in monthly monitoring on their own properties. And in the Geocatch area, Alison and Lindsay Woolridge, and now Elaine Haddon, are monitoring on a monthly basis and that will give us more information um, in your particular area. We were conscious of the fact that the coastal areas and the PT areas don't have adequate winter dung beetle activity in particular and so we've been running these seasonal transects along the north there, the Denmark area and then more recently, we've done one from Scott River up to Capel to cover your patch. And you can see that the, the, the images on the screen there, um, the, the coastal areas is quite, quite different. Um, low lying, subject to water logging, sandy soils, etc. So it needs to be specifically targeted. So quick shots here. Uh, starting from Scott River, Scott River and uh, Cutterdup are two sites where we've found native species. Now native species are inefficient in bovine or ruminant dung um, and all these trap sites we set up on this coastal transect were where there were large numbers of um, cattle. So we didn't find any imported dung beetles at Scott River or, or there. Uh, on the second row, Warner Glen, um, there were some bubis marsen there. Forest Grove, very few. Kawarama, more. And the, um, the photograph of the dung on the right hand side is from Ch uh, Cree Monaghan at Kawarama, where dung beetles are, are um, towering into the, the sheep droppings there. But you can see, if you look at this, this sand that's being brought up um, on that particular slide. Underneath we have, there were no beetles at all caught at um, Appa River, um, at Jindong. Whoops, we've gone, flicked one through. Jindong um, at uh, Ungarilla. And then Capel was the site where the most bubis bice and winter active beetles were, were trapped. So this is just a snapshot, a single transect that we run and it's just revealing that the uh, geocatch area is, is largely deficit on, on um, winter species. So the program where we're trying to rear dung beetles has been fairly much experimental. Uh, in the early stages. This is set up in September last year where beetles were um, newly hatched beetles. This is Ontophagus vacca, the, the beetle that's been imported through this program, um, was set up at Cambrai Cheese, was one of the sites. 
We have four experimental sites and Canberra has been the most successful with rearing a five-fold increase. Uh, more on that later. Kudnup College has intensive rearing cages established and they have Onthophagus vaca there at present. Um, hope, we're hoping for a significant population emergence in, in this next month or two uh, to be able to set up other sites. Last December, or January this was, we received so Onthophagus vaca emerges in early spring, breeds for approximately 12 weeks and then dies off, and the next generation emerges um, December, January. This generation emerges as an adult, feeds for um, some weeks, maturational feeding, and then tunnels down in what we call overwinters until they emerge to start breeding in the spring. So this is a site at Denmark where a colony was set up there. I'm going to quickly go through in the minute we have left of, of the specific advantages of dung beetles, particularly in pest control. So the rapid burial of dung avoids, and, uh, or particularly in winter, um, or in summer where they desiccate, the dung pad, it removes that humid uh, anaerobic pad that flies and nematodes like to breed. Um, and in the illustration, you can see that their little mites are attached to this dung beetle. These consume larvae, eggs and, and um, small larvae of nematodes and flies. Uh, and they hitch a ride from pad to pad on the dung beetles. So that's one way that the, um, the pests are controlled. As all farmers know, the quality of the feed that goes in will determine the nutritional quality of the dung that comes out. But what dung beetles do is cycle that dung. The nitrogen, um, it avoids that escape, rapid escape into the atmosphere. Importantly, organic matter, and I'll refer to that again in the next slide. In a trial that we had where we had dung with beetles and dung without beetles, after two years demonstrated that there were more humus forming bacteria in the, um, in the area that had dung buried by beetles, and there were more methane producing bacteria where there were no dung beetles. And this was after two years. That was a study, that was a DNA analysis done by um, bioscience. What dung beetles do is they actually physically turn over the soil. So one of our soil constraints is compaction. So they're bringing up subsurface. Uh, Beavis bison digs down to, this is a winter active beetle, um, 40, 50 centimetres. Onitis, kaffir can go to a metre. They bring up that subsoil with all those leached nutrients. Also aerates that soil so the gaseous exchange and nutrient availability for plants can occur. They encourage soil bacteria. So earthworms is an obvious one. Um, what they do with the humus, the additional humus and soil organic matter, it, it, it provides that pH buffer and it increases the cation exchange capacity. So it's building that soil fertility as well as improving the soil structure. Very importantly for your area is its influence on improving the water quality. Those tunnels create infiltration channels and reduces the runoff. First, the microorganisms to provide all that nutrient building uh, capacity the, the organic matter retains the moisture, provides that moist biofilm that microorganisms need to, to move and to function. And by doing all this, it improves your growing season, extends your growing season and improves the resilience of your pasture. Now, Doug is going to talk about uh, the uh, dung beetle's uh, capacity to disperse seeds. But the other area um, of enha enhancing the production 
is uh, reducing the amount of area in your paddock that's being fouled with uh, an unpalatable pasture that grows up around these dung pads. And it allows those roots through that work on avoiding compaction to, to dig down. A little bit of maths here for you. If you had 100 cows, and based on the assumption that a cow drops about 10 dung pads per day, which is roughly dinner pad size, if you had 100 cows, then you're going to cover two and a half hectares a year in this fouled material. But it's also two and a half tonnes of, of um, well, um, cubic metres, 2,578 cubic metres of dung that could be put to much better use. The image on the right hand side is a newly published uh, little pocket guide. Uh, there are 10 copies already at Geocatcher's office for the first 10 people who pop in to, to um, pick one up. Um, they are available, I can mail them out. So when you complete the survey, please indicate whether or not you would like um, one of these pocket guides mailed out to you. The project's website, dungbeetles.com.au, and there is a face page attached to the project. And I'm also indicating here some sites that we've set up um, in previous projects and particularly the Facebook page, which has lots of research papers and local information that goes with it. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Cathy, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, for those of our listeners who may have jumped in a little late after my introduction, welcome. Um, and we've just heard from Cathy. Just a reminder that uh, we can't see you or hear you. It's only the panelists that um, everyone can see and hear today. So if you do have any questions or comments, please use the chat button or the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen and type in any questions or comments. Um, we do need to move on to our next presenter, but before I do, we'll just see if we can address one of the questions that's popped up. Um, the question is, we would love to get more species that hatch at different times of the year. So we have a continuous active dumb beetle herd all year as we get a huge fly infestation at certain times of the year. And I think it is because the dung beetles are not present. Um, yes, dung beetles certainly have a role there. Um, what the monitoring will show is what dung beetles are present or not and the abundance of them because you need to have an adequate number of dung beetles to keep on top of the, um, the fly problem or the nematode problem. Um, but also in, in the Western Australian situation, we have flies coming in from the wheat belt. Um, and so we certainly need to be looking at the source area of our invasion of fly species as well. But yes, the monitoring will help us identify where those gaps are and uh, identify which particular seasonal activity needs to have attention. So yes, Elaine, I think that was the, the questioner. We're working on it. Okay, thanks, Cathy. All right, now um, we'll move on to our next presenter. So I'd like to welcome Doug Powell. As a result of his research projects, Doug has presented at events throughout Australia and globally through these webinars. Many people have visited his farm in Manjmup to see firsthand the positive effects of his trials and the use of biochar for livestock consumption and in growing avocados. So I'd like to welcome Doug. Hi everyone. Uh, my name's Doug Power. As uh, Janelle said, I'm a farmer in Manjmup and so uh, long before that <clears throat> had a farm in Pemberton um, where we had no dung beetles at all. Um, I bought the present farm in Manjumup about 10 years ago, we did, and uh, I noticed pretty good dung beetle activity. I identified the dung beetles and many of my little helpers here and children and uh, nieces and nephews 
are very, very interested in dung beetles. And this is digging up uh, uh, deep tunneling dung beetles in autumn. Um, this is a species we've imported from Tasmania called Geotrope spinager, uh, which we are not really sure whether we've got sorted. But uh, I did a few things when we took over this farm. It was a uh, pretty traditional vegetable growing farm, growing cattle, beef cattle. Had, like all farms in the district, had been a dairy for 100 years before. But we changed the carving from summer carving to midwinter. In fact, this year we just started a week ago. Um, we cut out, we did a lot of experiments. We basically cut out hand feeding the cows. We decided we'd cut out drenching the cows for, for worms. We decided we'd cut out uh, spraying pasture for uh, red-legged earth mite and lucerne flea. And we decided after doing a fertilizer test, all we really needed was trace elements, even though the previous farmer had been putting super copper zinc on, there, were no, there was no super and copper evident in the, in the uh, pasture test. So what, what's happened in the previous, or in the, from that previous time to the present? Well, the stocking rate hasn't changed, the prices we get at the sale haven't really changed, but the costs have come down and down and down and down. And it's largely to do with beetles. This beetle at the moment, Bubus bison, that's ragingly active all over our farm. It's actually very hard to catch in a trap, but you can see piles of dung pushed up alongside just about every dung pad on the farm within about a day. It's a, a big beetle and it goes down deep. And when I say deep, about 60 centimetres, about 600 millimetres deep. And you've got to realise that if you've been putting phosphorus fertiliser on your farm for 100 years, 90% of it's probably locked up 60 centimetres down below the surface. And these little beauties, they dig it all up and they make space to put the dung down in the ground and lay their egg in it. But to make that space, they bring all that subsoil to the surface with that locked up phosphorus in it. And I haven't put any phosphorus fertilizer on this farm for 10 years, and the phosphorus level is still going up. The beetles are bringing the phosphorus up that's already been purchased many decades ago. It's, uh, that one. Um, these are pictures of this beetle's activity. It's my neighbour showing a brood ball. We call it a ball, it's not really a ball, more like a sausage. But the picture on the left is a 600 millimetre deep hole looking down the, the shovel handle. And all those black spots on the bottom are vertical brood sausages that have been bored down from the surface down a hole. That dung's been taken down and there's one egg in each of those dung pads, they are dung sausages. There's one broken open, you can see the little egg in it. And that, that Bubis bison beetle is one of our two champion beetles in the southwest. It has to get, it's a once a year uh, breeding species. It, it breeds, basically lays eggs all winter and in theory should lay eggs in spring and I'll get onto that in a minute, but in our situation, it's pretty much finished by the beginning of October. But it has to get its young through the summer, and that's why it likes clay subsoil, because that clay will seal the moisture into that brood ball and allow that beetle to go through a larval and a pupal stage and hatch for the break of the season the following year. This is our next Champion beetle. This is a, uh, an African beetle. Bubis bison is a Mediterranean, North African, European beetle. Uh, Bubis bison is a smaller beetle. Uh, it's a wonderful beetle in our area. It starts to come out next month in August. It shouldn't. It's a summer beetle. It comes out in August because we don't have any specialist spring beetles. But I'll get onto that. We're working on that. It has 
at least three generations over the spring, summer and autumn and drags on into May and is in massive numbers in summer. It buries not as deep as the winter beetle, Bubis bison, but it's, it buries to about 20 centimetres, which is pretty damn good. Um, and it desiccates the pads very quickly so the flies can't uh, breed in the pad and is devastating on uh, nematode worm larvae. Um, this is our other summer, major summer beetle. This is a beetle from the Mediterranean, a smaller beetle uh, in huge numbers. They bury a bit more shallow, maybe only about 100 millimetres down, but in big numbers. And they'll dribble out in, in spring once again, because they're, uh, they're a summer beetle trying to fill a gap in spring when we don't have a spring beetle. But they're devastating in summer and they'll drag on into autumn because we don't have particularly good autumn beetles. Uh, I'll get on to what I saw in, in Europe shortly, but not those beetles. Um, this is a beetle that was brought into the southwest from Iran. It's a summer beetle. Uh, it likes warmer conditions than the previous two. It's in reasonable numbers through summer. Often you don't find them in the cool of the morning. Uh, they're more active up in the dung in the afternoon. But they're a bit of a tag team with the last two. This is what they're like. I'm not sure if you can see this as a video, but it's uh, probably 10,000 beetles in a dung pad on our farm. And if you look closely, you can see those three species that we've just had. I'd give that dung 24 hours and it wouldn't be recognizable. It's interesting, no fly or nematode's got a chance. You can see the different colors and sizes of the beetles. That's our aim. I'd like to see that all year. This is a beetle that has been released on our farm. Hopefully it's still there in 2017 in September. It was imported from Morocco and, and France. It's a Mediterranean beetle, but it's a specialist in spring. And we hope that it's going to be a spring beetle. Um, we're never really sure bringing a beetle from the northern hemisphere to a southern hemisphere to what as if it's going to really follow along. It's a, a sort of medium sized beetle. We fa I found them in Europe and I'll get onto that in a minute uh, in spring and hopefully it's uh, going to be effective. We released them in September. I found some adults newly hatched around about Christmas time. But I think they've disappeared into the background of, of the other beetles in, on our farm. And they may have to build up to a critical mass before I can find them again. But next month I'll be looking. They are put on top of a, a, a piece of dung that was shoveled up ready to go. And they came across from South Australia where they were bred uh, from the quarantine facility in a little bit of river sand. That's the sand. You can see the two-tone beetles, Anthophagus vacca. This is a, an amazing beetle that was brought in by the dairy industry of West Australia to be a specific spring beetle. It's a, the biggest beetle we've got. It was brought across from uh, Spain and France in the early 1990s and let go very successfully on one farm in Williams. Three years ago, I brought 118 of them across to our farm and let them go. And I've uh, introduced two other little numbers onto our farm. And we've now got them established on our farm. In fact, last night, one was banging into our window. And in fact, my wife got up thinking the dog was trying to get in. That's how hard they hit the window. Uh, 
They're attracted to light. They fly all night long. All the other beetles you've, uh, you've seen and I've talked about actually fly during the day, the summer beetles, or Bubus bison flies in the, in the dawn and dusk. But this beetle flies all night. And it's a brood caring beetle. It's a uh, female stays in a, in a hollow in the ground with balls that are actually loose in a hollow, multiple balls, three or four, uh, quite different to the other beetles. And they can live up to about maybe two years, it seems. But they were strangely brought as a spring beetle in Europe, and they're a winter beetle here. They come out with the break of the season, and we think they pretty much peter out when Bubis bison peters out. So funny things happening it happen taking beetles from the north to the south. They are they're damn big beetles up to 30 centimeters, up 30 millimeters long um, and strong. When they're trying to dig through your hand, when you're trying to hold them, they don't draw blood, but it sure feels like they're about to. You can see the beetles with a big horn are males. That second beetle from the from my palm uh, is a female. You can see it's got no big horn. Uh, and the furthest one to the the left, that's a female as well. This is some action on the ground of the sort of things you see when, when beetles are active. Uh, this is a combination of Bubis bison activity and uh, Copris his, hispanus activity. They move big volumes of soil up from quite a long way down. Now this is getting interesting. We never used to see mushrooms, toadstools, fungi, the fruiting bodies of fungi, all over and around where dung pats had hit the ground. But since I've started feeding biochar to my cows, and I did that primarily to test a carbon sequestration procedure to see if I could find a biological carbon sequestration that would be profitable. And I did this about nine years ago, about the time the Australian government had just blown $500 million on carbon sequestration from a coal-fired power station that never happened. And I worked out that you could put biochar through a cow, it went straight through the cow, and the beetles buried it into the ground. We did massive amount of testing with Professor Stephen Joseph of the University of New South Wales. It does wonders for the fertility of the ground. But the interesting thing is, it does wonders for the biological activity under the cow pat. The beetles bury it in the dung, the cows eat it, they chew it up, it gets smaller in size. The beetles bury it, the larvae of the beetle would chew it up, it would get smaller. But soon after it's buried, you get this proliferation of fungi which are attracted, they're wood rotting fungi, which is interesting. You get naturally in the forest. We didn't inoculate them, uh, but they enhance the breakdown of the material in the ground, including the, the dung and the assimilation of the nutrient. And if you put a fork under that dung pad, it would just be riddled with worms. The worms seem to be attracted to the fungal mycelium underneath that dung pad, because under that dung pad, you've got all these tunnels dug by the beetle and the, t the beetles run down the tunnels if a predator comes along like an ibis and they line the tunnels with dung. So the dung's not just at the bottom, it's, it's lining the tunnels so the tunnels don't fall down. So the roots of the pasture immediately after the dung's buried quickly recolonize that spot and of course a lot of the subsoil is brought to the surface as well and mixed in with the dung or put on top of the dung. So the, the pasture roots quickly recolonize the area and run down those, those tunnels, as do the hyphae and the mycelium from the, the fungi, and of course, then the worms as well. So it, it's take, quickly enhancing the biological activity to go to a, a very deeper depth than it would have without the beetles. 2017, in, in uh, 
French spring of 2017, we were going to Europe. So I made sure I went to Montpellier where the CSIRO has a facility and has had for many decades, about 50 years, and have collected most of the, the dung beetles. This particular farm in the picture is where the Onthophagus vacca were collected and we collected beetles there to come out to Australia. And I, I spent a week with uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre Lumeray, the entomologist who works with the, uh, <clears throat> the University in Montpellier, but also with CSIRO. And uh, there's a list of the beetles we collected out of one dung pad. Pretty much every dung pad had that selection of beetles. And this is spring. So you've got to think, those four species on the left are all deep tunneling beetles. They are all already in Australia. Bubus bison, you've seen a picture of. Bubus bubalis has been in Australia for about four or five years now and is slowly being disseminated out. We haven't got them on our farm yet, but they were in every dung pad with Bubus bison and they go a little bit later into spring in, Spa in France and Spain. Uh, they're closely related to Bubus bison. Copris hispanus, you've already seen. They're deep tunneling there in WA. And Geotrope spinager, we've brought across from Tasmania where they've been established. So we should be able to get all of those beetles going right through the southwest. They're already here. The next list, the shallow tunnelers, we've got VACA uh, in now, but we've got a a big list ahead of us there to bring in. They're the beetles that will do what our summer uh, small beetles are doing in, and what you saw in that uh, video. If we can get a reasonable assemblage of those shallow tunnelers into Australia and into the southwest, we should be able to do to dung in spring with that list what our summer beetles are doing in summer. But you notice in that list, there's no Onthophagus taurus. In spring here, we would find Onthophagus taurus in small numbers active. It's a summer beetle. It's working in spring because we don't have that list of spring beetles. So that's a work in progress. That's, that's an aim to get them into Australia, or a good few of them anyway. And rollers, we haven't got any rollers in West Australia. You see that little brood ball, that little ball, they've cut it out of a dung pat. There are two rollers there. That's uh, uh, Sisyphus chafferi, that's a fairly small roller. The other two, Scarabaeus, are really quite big beetles. Laticolus is about the size of a pubis bison, as, as is Scarabaeus sasa. Uh, I haven't got a picture of a Scarabaeus sasa here. You've got to be very brave to go down there. Uh, they, they were on the Camargue, the coastal sandy part of uh, the coastline just south of Montpellier. But that's where they raise fighting bulls. And if you want to see brave farmers, go and look at fighting bulls. Uh, dangerous. Uh, dwellers, we don't, don't really have dwellers other than Atophobius fumentarius, which is here as a as an accident from long back. Uh, the predators are interesting. Staphnolids are sort of a beetle with nippers on it that eat fly larvae and, uh, and nematodes. They were certainly in dung pats in France and there were occasional uh, colonies of fly larvae as well, but the staphnolids stopped them becoming um, adult, which is interesting. The um, a little uh, bar graph at the bottom is interesting. It gives you an idea of how just a few beetles really change the amount of uh, the amount of plant tissue and the amount of recycling of uh, of nutrient you can get from beetles. Um, we got up to twenty beetles in a dung pad in France. It was really interesting to see what happens when you get an equilibrium situation. We're far from an equilibrium situation in Australia. 
but we're working on it. Um, this is a little video. I hope it works as a video. These are rollers of cut a little ball and they make a perfectly round ball and they're working it through a difficult grass situation. When, you, when they get it out onto open ground, like crossing a road, you've got a jog to keep up. They could roll at anything from five to 20 yards from where the dung pat was and they'd make a shallow de depression and bury it. It's quite interesting. It would be a very good addition to our Southwest beetles to actually get some rollers in here. Doug, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to have to um, just touch base with time and people yes. as we watch those lovely dung beetles doing their job there. <laughs> I'm just noting that it is 12.45. Okay. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. Um, so what I might do is just address a question now. Yes. Uh, and get a response from you. And then if people need to leave, they can. Um, and if you do need to leave now, please just remember if you can to just complete the survey that pops up. Um, but one of the questions that we have is um, from a landholder who was at Ruwaban near Abba River. We have non-wetting soils and seasonal flooding. Dung beetle activity is great from December to February, but very little either side. Is this restricted activity due to our soil types and seasonal wetting? Also, I have found the same with nutrients being recycled to the surface from past practices. Also found worm numbers have reduced. Uh, we have seasonal wetting soil and flats that get flooded in winter. Uh, we certainly have good strong dung beetle activity on that. We don't have uh, non-wetting soil, but from what I've gathered from all over Australia, non-wetting soil is not an issue with beetles and pH differences don't seem to be an issue either. Um, I, I think if you've got very deep sand that is waterlogged and haven't got any clay, that could be a problem with beetles that have to over, over summer as a larvae like Bubis bison or Bubis pubalis or even Hispanus. Uh, if you've got a, a sand over clay, they probably cope with that. Uh, it, in theory, beetles die from waterlogging, but from what my experience of our waterlogging land is they seem to be pretty resistant to waterlogging as long as it's not underwater continuously for months. Um, as far as the recycling of nutrients and the numbers of beetles in summer, I think that's very good. Obviously the site is not poisoned with um, uh, drenches and uh, uh, residual in the dung because if you've got beetles at one season that's not the, the reason you haven't got beetles at another. Probably much of the problem is just lack of species. Okay thanks Doug. Um, if anybody watching does need to leave thank you for joining us. Um, if you do have a few more minutes, we will continue to go through Doug's um, slides and perhaps have time for one question. Um, so we hope to wrap up in 10 minutes. Um, but if you do need to leave now, please do and complete the survey if you can. And I'll hand back to you, Doug. Thank you okay. for that. Thank you. The pictures on the screen, uh, the dung uh, are feeding very low tech experiments of feeding cows biochar. This biochar comes from a company in Bunbury called Simcoa. It's not made for agriculture. It's the reductant in a smelting situation making silicon out of silicon dioxide sand from Bunbury. And it's just Jarrah charcoal basically. And they can't use the very fine material so we can buy it at a cheap price. And well, what we reckon is cheap. And I feed our cows six of those big 25 litre buckets a day and the slurping stuff I'm putting in there is either glycerine or molasses which is just a little bit of sweetener. I don't put much in there, it's about probably 10 to 1 with the biochar, that's not very expensive either, that's just a, 
a sweetness, but you can just as easily feed uh, grain or chaff or straw or anything else mixed in with it. Cows are very easy to train. I just use that because I don't feed anything else. Um, as you can see, they, they tuck in and it can be very low tech, low, low tech. That's just the end of a 44 gallon drum and the cows eat the lot and then lick each other's faces clean when it's finished. When you've, when you realize you've, you've got a cow trained and it's feeding on something that's not a food like biochar, then I decided, well, how can I use the tool of a beetle combination with a cow to, they were obviously just spreading the biochar. The cows were spreading it around the paddock. The beetles were spreading it down into the soil profile. And I thought, well, how can I piggyback on that and make them even more useful? So I decided to do a lot of experiments where I, I bought seeds of all sorts, pasture seed, and just put it in with the biochar, small amount, maybe a kilo or so, or so a day, at a time in summer when the beetles are shredding the dung, and that's dung that's had thousands of beetles in it, like you saw in that video. In summer, the break of the seasons come, those few seeds that have gone through the cow, and the cow probably chews a few up so they digest them. Other ones go right through. They're mainly clover seeds, subclovers, and they germinate when the rains come. And it's a very quick and easy way to repasture your whole farm. I do this every summer, buy a whole mixture of different seeds, and you only need one in each dung pad to be effectively germinated, and you'll repasture your, your whole farm in no time. Obviously, as you can see, it's very easy to get more than one seed go through and germinate. And you, it germinates, obviously, exactly as the plant decided, because the plant decided to, that it was a good idea for animals to eat their seeds and spread them around. But it's better than that, because they obviously land in a very, a very fertile spot in that they're in the dung. The cows are trained by millions of years of evolution not to eat the grass around the dung because of potential recontamination from parasites. So it gives the, the seed a chance to get away and you very quickly and cheaply repasture your farm. Here's a picture of dung, dung pat with biochar in it, the bubis bison in the middle of winter, that's a bubis bison beetle and the holes those holes are big enough to stick your finger down easily and they go down 600 millimetres and there's not much of that dung pat left. There's some soil brought up, gravel stones. Those beetles will push up gravel stones as big as themselves. Coprus hispanus will make a hole in the ground as big as your thumb and they'll push up gravel stones as big as themselves, 30 millimetres across. Uh, but a little bit of that biochar might end up on the ground, but the bulk of it, along with the dung, is packed down into the ground. It's carbon sequestration, and it combines with the clay in the ground and makes what they call an, egg, uh, an a biomineral complex and enhances the fertility of the ground. And from the measurements we've done over the last five or six years, under each of these dung pats with biochar in it, the increase in fertility looks like being permanent. So it's a pretty cheap and easy way to increase the fertility of your ground and sequester carbon to make the beetles happy and the cows happy. But the beetles form an equilibrium with the cows. There's a certain optimum number of beetles to the number of cow pats. If you halve the number of cows, you'll halve the number of beetles. You won't necessarily halve the number of species, but the beetles number, the population goes up in proportion to the amount of dung they've got to feed. So if you can increase the stocking rate, even by buying in food for the cattle from off your farm, you'll actually increase the number of beetles you're farming. Um, I see myself more as a, a beetle farmer and let the cows do their own thing. The cows seem pretty happy with that actually. 
This is an interesting picture. We also grow avocados. We've, we've um, done all sorts of experiments putting charcoal under avocados before they were planted, which came about because of the experiment with the cows. But this is a picture looking vertically down right across a paddock. We took a grader, a road grader, and we graded 100 mil off the top. Then we graded another 100 mil off that. Then we graded another 100 mil off that. That darkness and black in the soil, and that's midsummer, that's biochar being buried over six years by beetles burying dung with, with uh, biochar in it. The, the organic matter in the cow dung is slowly eaten away by worms and microbes, but the biochar is permanent. It's sequestered into the soil, becomes part of the soil, and becomes an integral part of this fertility of the soil. It's very easy to do, very cheap to do, and it's a permanent increase in the soil fertility and the soil structure. It's basically forming a terra preta. Uh, any, anybody got any questions? <laughs> I know parts of it are simple, parts of it are complicated. Thanks, Doug. Um, there has been another couple of questions pop up. Um, I'll just jump up to one that was at the start. So I guess either Kathy or Doug could answer this one. Um, how are we affecting the dung beetles with using some sprays and drenches on cattle? Well, the, the quick and easy question is, poisons designed to kill insects kill insects. It's simple. If if you've got a, an insect that's susceptible to a poison and you expose it to the poison, you'll almost certainly kill it. If you've got a drench that is, is voided from the animal you give it to, whether it's internal or poured on, if it comes out through the feces, through the dung, it will be effective at killing insects in that dung. Different drenches for different lengths of time. The worst ones can be effective in the dung at killing dung beetles and dung insects for up to 400 days. Some other beetles, some other drenches, uh, like the very old white drenches that are mouth drenches, are uh, exterminated through, well, voided through the cattle in the urine and they don't affect the dung. There are, there's a range in between. And some people will, especially drench sellers, will say, oh, a particular drench won't kill beetles. If you read the fine print, not provided by them, but in, uh, in university papers, um, and a lot of research has been done on this, many, many drenches won't kill the adult beetle, but they'll kill or deform the larvae. So the beetle will actually die out over generations. And many farms that are sprayed often and drenched often will have no beetles at all. And that's primarily the reason. I stopped drenching and beetles went berserk. And it happened quite quickly. And if you can get a very high level of beetles and strategically rotationally graze, you probably won't have to drench at all. Our biggest dairy down here only drenches a handful of the tail of the mob. They, they milk over a thousand cows. They have about a four week uh, rotation. They basically don't drench and don't spray pasture at all. It can, it can be done and they're in a much wetter condition than we are. Um, I haven't noticed a great problem with, um, with pasture um, red-legged earth mite or uh, loosened flea. Uh, if you spray a day flying beetle when they're in the dung in the daytime with say some uh, uh, very fast knockdown uh, spray for say red-legged earth mites, you'll certainly kill the beetles. Um, but cows are resistant, far more resistant than sheep. Barber's pole worms are a bit of a problem with sheep, but I still think it's worth persisting with. The addition of um, biochar in, 
into the diet of ruminants seems to, in some part, act as, a, as an anti-parasite medication. There's a small amount of phenolic substance in the pores of the, of the charcoal, and there's a physical scraping effect of the fibrous charcoal. It'll shine up a shovel when you shovel it, so it might actually be effective at swiping off some of the small <clears throat> nematodes out of the wall of the gut. A quick add on um, to that. Sheep are, uh, is an issue, uh, and that's one of the focus of this particular project. Initially, in the dung importation program, the focus was on bringing in dung beetles that will devour cattle dung. Now, we appreciate that there are a lot of sheep properties that don't have adequate number of dung beetle species that will use sheep dung. So that's a focus for this particular program. The, be the beetles that are being imported currently, and one's being held up at the moment because of the COVID lockdown in, the, um, the, in France and Morocco, but the beetles that we're importing through the program are designed for sheep properties as well as capital properties because it's difficult for a sheep farmer to avoid using um, drenches if there isn't a population of dung beetles on site to deal with the manure. I should add that the Cobras hispanus, Bubus bubalis and Bubus bison and Omphophagus vacca, all in Australia are all very good at dealing with sheep dung. So <clears throat> we're not starting off from a possibility of no beetles for a sheep farm. Um, out at Williams, Cobras hispanus will demolish a whole sheep camp overnight to nothing. They're devastating on sheep. So we do have some beetles particularly good at doing it. They just need to be moved around geographically. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kathy and Doug. The questions are flying in, um, but time is ticking, unfortunately. Thank you to um, our presenters for today. Um, and for those of you who have put in some questions that we haven't had time to answer, we will get back to you um, after this webinar. So we've got your email addresses and your phone numbers so we can contact you direct and the questions are still coming. <laughs> well, we can email um, some answers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll certainly be in touch with everyone. We can email you um, some answers. And if you've got any more questions, you can put them in the survey that will pop up shortly um, or contact Geocatch direct. And um, yeah, I can put you in touch with Kathy or Doug. Um, don't forget, we've got our little pocket guides here. One of the questions is, can we download it online? Um, we'll get back to you unless Kathy can give me a quick yes or no. I can't download it, but a lot of the information in it is on the website. Okay, no problems. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Kathy and Doug. Um, it's not really a great lunchtime topic talking about dung, <laughs> um, but yeah, with the number of participants and questions that we've got coming through, um, obviously everyone's really interested. So thanks so much. Um, so this is going to end this session now. If you're interested in more topics for a webinar series, please let us know in the survey or contact um, me at GeoCatch, I'm Janelle, um, and we can direct you to Kathy and Doug for some, um, for some answers and information as well. So I'm going to hit end now. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kathy and Doug. Thank you. Bye. Bye.